Today, we have another interview in action from the conferences that just happened down here in Miami and Orlando. My name is Bill Russell. I'm a former CIO for a 16 hospital system and creator of This Week Health, a set of channels dedicated to keeping health IT staff current and engaged. We want to thank our show sponsors who are investing in developing the next generation of health leaders, Gordian Dynamics, Quill Health, Tausite, Nuance, Canaan Medical, and Current Health. Check them out at thisweekhealth.com slash today. Here we go. All right, today we have another one of our post hymns hymns interviews. Essentially, we couldn't get to everybody we wanted to speak to at the conference. So uh, we have some Zoom calls set up afterwards. And today we're talking to Dr. Malik Pirwit with University Hospitals. He's the Associate CMIO, and we're going to talk precision medicine. Malik, welcome to the show. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. This is, this is a quite an honor to be on this. Well, the you did a presentation at HIMSS, I think, that really hits on a lot of different uh, intersections of things and, and people are very interested in, and that is around precision medicine. Give us a little background on what the what the conversation was about and some of the, some of the key topics that you addressed in your presentation. Absolutely, and uh, thank you for for having me and for all of us on this. It's uh, you know it's a topic that's near and dear to me for many reasons. One. And the main reason is because it offers the potential to really drive patient care in a much more personalized and individual way. We often, you know, have healthcare in a generic ways, and, and we kind of sometimes lose the individual in the forest. And we, this is the opportunity to really use technology to drive better patient care. And precision medicine is really about understanding the individual patient their reactions to medications or treatments or analysis or diagnosis, and then translating that to a better customized level of care for the patient. Yeah, so where, where are we at on this? Because we've talked about this a bunch on the show, and it's, it's one of those where we say, okay, now we're going to be able to really get uh, precise with the medications that we're giving. And, you know, there's a, in most medications, there's a population that it works really well in and a population that it doesn't work well in. Uh, have we gotten to the point where we can identify which patients and, and how are we operationalizing uh, this work? Yeah, great, great question. So the answer, is, as you can imagine, is not an easy black or white. It's a yes and a no. And for some things we have, and I'll let me take you through a little bit of the, the reasoning background as to why it's so complex and we talk about it, but haven't had the success yet that we hope to achieve. And I'll compare it to another industry, which is the electrical vehicle injury, uh, electric vehicle injury, which, you know, took some time, right? And we used internal combustion engines for over 100 years. Yeah, that, that's an understatement. It took some time for the electric vehicle. <laughs> it's, it's, it's still evolving. But now we're seeing, you know, Volkswagen saying we're taking our whole fleet in that direction. So it, it's, it's hit that tipping point. Yeah, that's exactly, I think, where we are with, with precision medicine and then what I would say is this concept of uh, clinical decision support, which includes to me AI and machine learning and precision medicine all in, all in one. But, you know, it took over 100 years to get us to a battery powered vehicle. And even then, there's a lot of doubts, right? In 2010, everybody laughed at Elon Musk and said, we're a gas nation, it's never going to work. And now Elon Musk is laughing and saying, well, look, everybody else is comparing yourselves to me. And I think that's the same thing that's going to happen in precision medicine and healthcare IT in general. You know, so with precision medicine specifically, you know, and I'll get to one use case that you mentioned is a medication. Can we identify one medication that's going to work for one population of patients, but not others? And then from that standpoint, give better personalized care. And so it starts with someone's genetic code and what they have in their DNA, literally in their DNA, and then how that translates to who they are as a person. And there's a long pathway from, that, from the genetic code to who we all are as people because there's that genetic code, but there's the environment that we all live in. And so I'll give a, a simple example is you may have a, again, this is just for concept, but let's say you have a gene for being seven foot tall and that's great, but then you may have grown up in an environment where you didn't get proper nutrition or whatever it may be. And so you may not achieve what the genetic code dictates because the environment also influences the genetic code and what is expressed into the phenotype. In the same way, we're learning a tremendous amount about the genetic code and what we can do and how that translates to disease, how that translates to our metabolism medications, our processing medications, 
bioavailability, bioavailability of medicine, medicines and our reaction to treatments and, and so on and so forth. And so one area that you identify, which is fantastic, is medication response. So in one area, we do have some success and knowledge, which is with depression treatment. And there's a medication class called SSRIs, Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors. These are the Selexa, Lexapro, Prozax that uh, people talk about. And one of the struggles in the past was how do you identify the right medication for the right patient? Because I might prescribe, let's say, it, just hypothetically, I might prescribe to you Selexa for you, or I might prescribe Selexa for patient B, and e each of you may have a very different reaction. One might have an allergic reaction that makes it unusable. Another person might have a fantastic response that that's all they need, and they are back to you know, conducting their lives normally. And we don't know that a priori, meaning when somebody walks into the clinic space and I see them, there is no way for me to know how they're going to react right now. Now with precision medicine and with the partnership, to be precise, what we've been able to do is take that and say, okay, we can analyze that genetic code. So if they've had the lab test to get the genetic code, we can put that into our pharmacogenomics area, analyze that genetic code, see what matches with the best SSRI, and then have a much better educated guess as to what's going to affect them in a positive way rather than the trial and error way that we often are used to in medicine. Well, I wish I could ask better questions on that. I'm not a, I'm not a trained uh, clinician. And even if I was, I'm, I'm definitely not a, somebody who's a geneticist. So to, to ask the questions that go in that direction, what I want to ask though, is for the clinicians who are hearing this going, that's really interesting. How, you know, what does that look like day to day with the EHR, with the, the integration? I mean, are we adding steps? Are we adding screens? Or is this one of those things where you, you put in the medication, it's looking at the data and it's popping up something that says, hey, consider this? Yeah, great question. And so that brings us to the infrastructure side of it because you may have the knowledge, but if you can't bring it infrastructure-wise into the technology space and, and the workflow, then it, it's not going to be used. And so and that's where a lot of my focus is. And I'll, and I'll be upfront. I'm not the expert in genetics. I'm not the expert in uh, cancer care. But my role as associate CMIO in, in the Innovation Lead for Transformation is to help uh, put this into the workspace that it can be supported and used and support our clinicians in the work that they're doing. And so, and there's a long process for this. And this is where, you know, an organization like To Be Precise has been very instrumental for us which is one is getting the blood test first and foremost that allows us to get the, the genetic code from people into the EMR. But that process is pretty long. So you go, let's say you get the lab test, you go to the lab. Now what often happens is a lab may not be interfaced with your EMR in other places. And so they send a PDF result of the genetic code. And the problem is that a computer looks at a PDF as, a, as an image and it can't decipher the content of that message. And so you need to have it in what's called structured data or discrete data. And to be precise, it's been really instrumental in helping us take that interface from the lab to our, inter to our EMR and convert all of that into structured data that we can then analyze in real time with the computer. Now, once that data is in there with the genetic code, to be precise also helps us curate the data because if I give a length of genetic code to our clinicians, even our geneticists, they won't be able to use that because it's, it's really raw data that doesn't have much meaning. So we need to convert the raw data into knowledge that then supports clinical care. So that's the other part is using the expertise from To Be Precise to curate that data, look at what scientific literature out there, compare that to genetic code, put all that together, and then convert that to a decision support tool that the clinician can now use. And then from our side, we then take that and then convert that into the EMR into the workflow of the EMR and the user interface to make it usable in real time for the clinician. And so then the clinician has all of this knowledge, not just raw data, but knowledge in front of them in their workflow as they see a patient that allows them to use that knowledge and treat, better, uh, treat the patients in a better manner. So let me, let me ask two different questions. One is uh, Quest LabCorp, will they supply that data in, a, in discrete data? Yeah, great question. So I don't request like 
that I don't know that lab specifically, but what most labs do is they give us the data and then for us, what we're actually working on with to be precise is to take all of that data, put that into a single pipeline that comes to us into the EMR. And typically most labs don't have the ability to convert it into discrete data. And so we have to do that on our side. And then that's where we have a partnership with to be precise to do that. So talk about adoption. So adoption is always one of those things when we talk about these kinds of projects, I mean, the, 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 the capabilities that you're describing are, have a lot of promise and, and, and are very exciting. The question yeah. becomes when you get that, that clinical decision support in front of the clinicians, how did you get them to, I don't know, to, to use it, to want to use it, to understand what it meant when it actually did pop up in front of them? Yeah, great question. I love this topic. And, and I'll tell you the key to adoption is a great product. Right? I don't know if you have an iPhone or an Android or whatever, but nobody had to tell me to get an iPhone. I got it. I get one every so often. I update it. I love using it. Nobody has to tell me to go use my iPhone. Everyone has to tell me to stop using my iPhone, right? Or whatever smartphone you have. And it's the same thing with IT products in healthcare space is, you know, traditionally we've given physicians and nurses a bad name and said, oh, there's adoption is a struggle. But we haven't said, well, we've given them a bad product. If I'm going to give you a product that is going to increase your work time by two hours, not have much clinical meaning, and really not impact anything in a way that's meaningful for the clinician, well, the adoption is going to be an issue. However, if I give you a product in your space that reduces your clinical load in terms of time, but also gives you better patient care, and it's actually decision support and helps what you're doing, adoption is very easy. And so to me, the question of adoption is not the question of, Will someone use the product? The question of adoption is, are we giving them the right product in the right way at the right time that makes it easy to use? And the same thing, like if you wanted to get a cab and your Uber app was so painful that you couldn't get a cab and it took you 15 minutes, you would just walk out the airport and get a cab outside. But because the Uber app is so easy, adoption's not an issue. Yep. And it's the same thing I would say here. Fascinating to me. It's 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 a platform, so I'm going to be able to apply it to many different many different specialties. I would assume across the board. Yeah, and we have many different initiatives in our system. So the one you described, pharmacogenomics, that we went into a little bit more depth. That's one of our other ones, but we have it for our fertility and and OB areas. We're looking at it for pediatrics, looking at it for oncology. So there's many use cases, and as you said, it's a perfect question because. Once you create the platform and the process, the use cases are, are plenty. And in fact, we've had people in some departments actually use it and uptake it without us doing any marketing or any education. They saw the value in it and they started using it and our numbers went up and we're actually surprised because we monitor the data and we had adoption areas we didn't expect, but they love the, the information that they're getting and now we're getting more demand for it. And so this is a huge consumer. It's, it's a huge need from the consumer side, but the consumer isn't just the patient. The consumer is your providers, your nurses, your patients all together because they want a better way to take care of patients. And so this is huge. And I'll tell you the other, the other part we haven't hit on yet, but is also a limitation, is the access to the test to get your genetic code. A few years ago, it was very expensive. It might cost you three, $4,000 out of pocket, which as you can imagine, limits the access tremendously. The cost has come down because we've gotten better at getting the genetic code, but getting insurance reimbursement to cover the cost of the test would be fantastic because that's going to really drive better care. And up front, there's a cost, but in the long run, it'll pay for itself because you're providing better care up front to the patient and eliminating some of the downstream effects of poor care up front. And so that's the other area that um, needs development. Fantastic. Malik, I want to thank you for your for sharing your experience and I really appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It's been an honor to have, be on here. Thank you for having me. Another great interview. I want to thank everybody who spent time with us at the conferences. It is phenomenal that you shared your wisdom and your experience with the community, and it is greatly appreciated. We also want to thank our channel sponsors who are investing in our mission to develop the next generation of health leaders, Gordian Dynamics, Quill Health, Towsite, Nuance, Canon Medical, and Current Health. Check them out at thisweekhealth.com slash today. Thanks for listening. That's all for now.